whenever you're ready. All right. Hi, my name is uh, Chitanya Koche. Uh, I'm from Cluster 4 Cybersecurity. And I did my project on biometrics and uh, home alarms and home security. All right, so as the years progress, technology gets better and people get smarter. And I'm not saying people that are preventing robbers get smarter, but also robbers get smarter. So they could uh, get into houses, uh, they could hack into your phone, they could hack into your computer uh, quickly and efficiently. So in uh, home alarms, there's a couple different ways that uh, they work. And the, the two main ones right now is close, um, closed circuit and open circuit. Uh, there's a picture of a closed circuit magnetic sensor over there. And basically, uh, the closed circuit sensor works when um, uh, the alarm gets triggered when uh, ele the electric flow is interrupted, which means that uh, like the electric circuit is closed when a door or window is closed. So, like say I open a door, then nothing happens. But if I close the door again, then the alarm goes off, and the, uh, the, the uh, law enforcement will come. And the second type is called the uh, open circuit system, and it works the complete opposite of the closed circuit system. So pretty much when a door window is open, uh, the circuit closes and the electricity flows. But there's a lot of flaws in the open circuit system because if you just cut the connecting wires, then uh, you can stop the alarm from going off because it's pretty much the same as uh, the, the two wires not connecting. So that it's really easy to get into a house. But clearly, the closed circuit also has its issues because people still get into um, homes and uh, rob things from people. So there's obviously issues with that right now. <clears throat> also, um, another type of um, uh, security that they use in home alarms is light, uh, using laser beams or light methods. Like usually it's a, it's a light sensor pretty much. So if something interrupts the reflection, of um, let's say um, like a uh, let's just like an ultrasonic light sensor. If something gets in the way and like something interrupts the reflection, and the reflection doesn't happen, and an an alarm is signaled. So you guys have seen in the movies there's like red laser beams pointing across the wall, protecting like the really expensive diamond or whatever. <laughs> so that's pretty much what I'm talking about right now. And once like once something obstructs the two laser beams from connecting to the other side, then the alarm triggers and law enforcement arrives. However, all the robbers in the bad guy movies, they're able to somehow hack into the system, turn off the lasers, or maybe they're extremely flexible or something and they could somehow get through the lasers. I mean, you never know and it happens these days and it's just not, it's not reliable to have these type of sensors to protect things that we possess. And these things are called PIR sensors, which says uh, which stands for passive sensors, and uh, they're just like heat sensors. So when the heat sensor works by detecting like large amounts of heat, so for example, the human body temperature is, is a little bit over 90 degrees, right? So the sensor detects that, and sunlight or, or like a microwave or a heater or something, if it gets to that point, these sensors recognize uh, when it's that when is that hot so it doesn't take that into consideration it only has like a specific uh, bandwidth for how much uh, how much the temperature could be and then it goes off but one way to um, stop this is a obviously to hack the system somehow and turn off these sensors but another way is to put something cold on the uh, on the sensor because it doesn't usually detect very very cold uh, objects because obviously a person is not going to be cold so it's not smart enough yet to detect that, like extreme temperatures that are cold, and also when it gets like um, when it's in the winter winter time at places where it snows, it can't detect that. It can't detect where it's like really cold. So if you just spray, I don't know, like a fire extinguisher on it, then uh, the sensor goes off. I mean, it doesn't go off. All right. Um, so another form of security is Bluetooth. And Bluetooth is, uh, is a new arising field and lots of people have been doing a lot of research on it. However, it has a lot of flaws as well as benefits. So some benefits of Bluetooth are that if you forget your key car keys in uh, your car, I think it's uh, uh, Chevrolet, you can actually access like your, uh, the interior lights of your car, 
the trunk of your car, the engine of your car, and even the doors of your car. So if somebody just stole your phone and hacked into it, you could pretty much have access to your car. And um, Bluetooth also works for, let's say, like refrigerators, washers, dryers, smart meters. And um, it also has access to a lot of uh, like bank passwords and stuff. So if somebody gets your phone, and it's not really that hard to hack into a phone, obviously, because people do it all the time, right? Like iPhones or any smartphone. <laughs> And obviously, like you could report it and turn off the SIM card or whatever. But if it happens so quick that you could uh, that the robber can access possessions that you own, then you really have nothing. You pretty much gave all of your possessions, all your money, everything that you've bought, everything that's expensive and uh, that's yours. It's pretty much the robbers. All right. So um, a new method that is arising, as Eric talked about recently, is biometrics. Specifically, biometrics in home alarms. And biometrics goes way, way, way back, because fingerprinting is also a form of biometrics. So it first started with the ancient Babylonians. They actually pressed the tips of their fingers into clay to record business transactions, like trades or whatever they wanted to do. Also, the Chinese use uh, ink on paper finger impressions for like business, and they use it to help identify their, their kids. And the first time that biometrics was used um, for, for criminals was around in the 19th century when uh, England was taking over India. The Englishmen would uh, take the Indian criminals and make them put their fingerprint on paper or something so that they could record, like, who's the bad guy. And this new field of biometrics, it's obviously going to be hard to install and it's going to be... It's, it's, it takes a lot of money to uh, install, but the benefits are like, definitely outweigh the cost because if you protect your house and everything that you own and you just pay the money to install this biometric system, the possessions that you own and the install, installation of the biometric uh, system, uh, there's obviously a lot of difference, so it's definitely worth it to install these in homes. Also, as, uh, as the years progress and technology gets like better and faster, then uh, uh, this biometric system can definitely stop robbers because there's almost no way to hack into a system or not not hack you could obviously hack but if you if you make the biometric system secure however there's absolutely no way that a robber could uh, impersonate somebody else because how the way that the biometric system works is that uh, it it uses like distinct features of a person such as like the distance between the eye sockets uh, the width of the the width of like your face, I mean whatever. It uses three distinct features that are extremely hard to replicate. And hopefully in the future, if somebody, uh, it could recognize like plastic, uh, plastic surgery, you know, so that a uh, robber can't impersonate somebody else. All right, so um, biometrics started uh, in the 1960s when it first tried to recognize Biometrics, I mean biometrics and computers, when they try to make computers recognize humans, that research started, started in 1960, and it's been what, around like uh, almost 52 years or something like that, and we've obviously come a long way. So the way that the um, biometric system works right now is that uh, there's, there's pretty much five steps with the biometric system. So first, the, the first step that it has is it's detection. So if somebody's in a crowd, or if somebody's uh, trying to come into a house or anything, it detects the uh, suspect and it detects the robber, and the person's face gets into the database. And it really doesn't matter what angle the face is at, as long as like just the back is showing, just the back isn't showing. So you have to show some of the face, and what it does is um, uh, it aligns the face so that uh, it turns a 3D model into a 2D model. So it, it, it completely rotates the face so that it pretty much looks like a picture. And you could, um, if you can identify the, the person, then it's as, it's as easy as that, then it's only two steps. But usually, uh, there's a lot more steps. So the third step is measurement. So I was talking about these three distinct features that a uh, biometric system uses. And that's what the measurement is for. It measures, uh, I'll tell you again, like the distance between the eye sockets, the width of your face, whatever. The, they're just distinct and you can't really replicate them. Uh, the fourth step is translation. 
And so what it does pretty much is all these measurements that uh, the biometric system gets out, it translates these into some sort of code that only that database can uh, that, that only that database can recognize and it, it runs uh, like facial recognition scans between other like suspects and there's actually a long process for that I'll get to that in a little bit and the fifth step is the, probably the hardest longest and most important step it's the matching phase that's when you have the suspect and you have a whole database running through and you're trying to find uh, a match so there's actually a lot of different searches that you can conduct uh, to find out who the suspect is. The, the smallest search, and the, uh, it's called the local feature analysis, the LFA template, and, no wait, I'm sorry, it's called the vector template, that's the first one, and it's for a, a, a small target group, and uh, it's like a really rapid search, so for example, like it searches close friends or relatives or neighbors, stuff like that. And then the second broadest is the uh, local feature analysis template. It's called the LFA template. It's a secondary search in case the vector template cannot find uh, a match. And the broadest of them all is the STA, uh, surface texture analysis. It pretty much analyzes everybody that that uh, that's in like uh, that's in that, that's that's in range to like rob your house or whatever. And uh, there's still issues with the biometric system because people wear ski masks, which completely covers like their entire face, and they also wear uh, like sunglasses or like you know other other types of uh, things that can uh, cover your face. But as the biometric system like improves and stuff, maybe with uh, if ski masks are worn, then maybe they could just use the eye systems as uh, Eric was talking about earlier. And biometrics not only help stop robbers when they get inside, but also on the outside. If, if the robber knows that, the, that a house has a biometric system, it's kind of an inti intimidation factor because why would you want to rob a house with such like, great security unless you want something extremely bad, but you're probably going to get caught. And the main reason why robbers rob is to get the most benefit for themselves. So if you rob a house with high security, then you're not really benefiting yourself. So. Uh, it's, it's an intimidation factor as well. So the new system that uh, I hope will work in the future is that the biometric system should recognize uh, the people that come into your house often. So obviously the people that live there, like immediate family, then maybe they could recognize people that have that. So right now we use a lock and key method. So you obviously trust people that you give your key to a lot. So maybe if you if the database can recognize the person that you're really close to that has your key or anything, they're like really close friends. And right now, you have to punch in a passcode when you enter a house to turn off the alarm or else the authorities will arrive. But actually, um, every month, around 300 calls are made to the uh, police department and it's, it's an accident. Like, it's, it's completely unnecessary. And the police could be doing something else. They could be investigating like a crime or something, but instead they have to come to the house for no reason. Also, you you apparently have to pay a hundred dollars every time you make the authorities arrive. So it's it's really just a lose lose situation. So uh, the way that this would work is that you would uh, if you bring somebody that hasn't been into your house ever, you would have to insert the passcode because the database doesn't recognize it. But then if it's like close friends, then uh, the database recognizes it. And uh, the second picture, it shows how the facial recognition system works. It shows the five steps. So it shows that uh, they found the person through a whole group of people, and then they aligned it so that it makes it 2D, and then it runs the coding, and it tries to find a match. And then this bottom picture, it identifies um, certain parts of the body that I was talking about, those distinct features that you can't, uh, that you can't duplicate. And that's how it works. And I hope that in the future this could be uh, the new system of security, and not only in home alarms, but I believe that it could also be really effective in airports for stopping, stop, sorry, stopping criminals. And it, it's, already been, uh, it's already been put into work right now, but there's all, obviously been a, a lot of controversy because they say that it just takes an entire body scan and people aren't really comfortable with this. but. Hopefully in the future we can make it comfortable for everybody, safe for everybody, efficient, and it would stop thieves.
Thank you. So, uh, a quick question. So, so, if this is the only system that, that I would have, and I want to let you into my house, okay, it's very important that, that you get into my house, uh, to your friend. Okay, okay. Uh, how, how would I do it then? Uh, if I want to come into your house? No, if I want to let you in, but, but uh, I'm not using a passcode or a key. Well, I could use a key, but uh, uh, how would I, uh, how could I, how could I make this happen? Uh, like, well, first of all, um, if you're, if you are with me, Usually right. the system should be able to detect that okay. maybe we're friends or something. Okay. But if you think about it, if somebody has somebody at gunpoint and I, I make yeah. you get into my house or right. something, that's obviously uh, like a really bad situation. Uh -huh. But in that case, I would say that if in like 30 seconds or something, you don't do something to deactivate a code, then the database should recognize that something's wrong, that I have like a gun and I'm putting you at like gunpoint. Okay. And I guess <clears throat> this will like limit the amount of Authorities that have to come per mm -hmm. month. Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, wasn't the whole point that um, it recognizes you and you don't have to deactivate it? So no, no, no. I mean, uh, it, if 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 you're coming to like my house for the first time or something, then it has to like then you have to deactivate it because I don't trust you. <laughs> <laughs> Mark and I. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sure. Thank you.